Okay, this little video, we're talking about Gibbs. But of course, to talk about Gibbs, we have to talk about Waze also. And I'll just introduce this whole project here while we're here. This is a hollow spindle lathe that should have gone to the grave. It actually had gone to the grave. I mixed it with another lathe. We're putting new bearings in it. We're uh, gonna have a 11 inch hollow spindle with an electronically driven uh, feed screw on it so that we can do both inch and, uh, believe it or not, metric threads. <laughs> yes, from me. Yes, metric threads, because they're nice to be able to do. They are a part of the real world. Okay, <clears throat> so your lathe cross feed ways, we have cut new, new ways on these. You notice that this is a dovetail and that allows one piece to lock into the other and it'll grab underneath here. That keeps it from coming up. That gives it a position in this direction and also side to side. But to make it tight, you notice this side of the way is cut crooked. One side is smaller than the other. Originally, there was this gib that went in here. This is the original gib and that was to take up the space and you can adjust it. The reason why we're not using it is because with everything recut, it's too small. So this one, which you notice is thicker, is gonna be the new one that goes in there. We haven't cut the groove in it yet. We haven't fitted it. And when we do, then that groove goes like this. You have a double-sided groove and this one here has been hammered. Normally there's a little half round on the end for the screw to fit in. And so once we cut the groove at the right spot, cut the end off, and we will have a place for the screw to fit on the gib. Then you adjust the gib to where you want it. You want the gib to have <clears throat> just a little bit of drag as it moves along. You don't really want everything to totally float, even though it does to some extent in a lot of machines. And as you use your machine more and more, it's going to wear out the ways, the gibs, everything is just going to wear out more in the position that you use it the most, where it gets the most wear. It's going to wear out there. It's not going to stay consistent through the whole travel. This one had about a 16th inch difference between where it was being used a lot and where it would bind up on the ends. And so it was just not non-functional. This was a non-functional machine for any kind of accurate work, so it was time to remachine it. Now, the gibs don't always lock the same. A um, couple of things about them. Also, the, the gibs, it is angled to match the angle here. You end up with a parallelogram. Um, so your shape is, seems a little wonky to people, but that's the shape anyway, it's a parallelogram. These two sides are parallel, but they're not on top of each other. They're spread out a little ways. So setting this up to mill these is a little bit tougher than it looks at first. And unfortunately, I think we did this before we were taking videos at all, actually. But there's some tricks to that. I don't remember to be mentioning what they are right now. If we go to mill in another set, then we'll write that stuff down in video world. Um, but anyway, this one here locks in with a screw and that's how that one works. If we come over to um, some of our other machines over here, like this mill that I was going to initially describe ways on a little bit, this one has a way that goes across it, but instead of having a single screw that locks in a little slot, it's got a separate screw on each end that lets you move the way forward and back, well, side to side on this one. And with it all assembled, also, you can see here on the end again, let's come down here and look at the end. You can see this pretty good, how this is laid out. You've got a dovetail here that fits into a fixed dovetail, and then a dovetail on the other side, and the space is taken up again with a gib. The gib is smaller on this side. I had to actually measure this. Some machines, you can see the taper right away. Others, you can't right off. But uh, like this one here, I, I make, this side is smaller. So to tighten this one, we would run the screw, loosen it on this one, tighten the other one. Um, this is fairly new machine, doesn't need to be adjusted. The, uh, another thing you'll see sometimes, you'll see occasionally where there's two gibs, one running on each side. 
instead of having a gib that goes all the way across, they'll get just partial contact. And you'll have a gib on this side and a gib on this side. Another one that we will see once in a while. Yeah, let's see. One of our mag drills is where you see this the most. And it's not a bad way if you have to build uh, gibs for things. And you're building a temporary tool, something portable now and then. So you just use a series of screws. This one here is just a, just a straight piece of bar stock. And if you come in on the look on the top of that, they built the gib and then over there on the right, you'll see where there's just that piece of bar stock basically. And then what they do is behind the bar stock, you just have some set screws and a lock nut so that you can carefully adjust each one of them so you get a little bit of uh, drag in there. And that also, you're, there's nothing critical then about the gib you build. It's, uh, in fact, a lot of times, yeah, this one here doesn't even have the parallelogram. It's just a small enough piece of stock to fit in there. It's just a piece of material. And uh, sometimes they dimple behind the set screws and sometimes they just let them float. I, uh, the dimples are better because then that'll keep the gib from moving when you, uh, when you have it in there. And so that's gibs.